Hi, everyone. Well, I know that you have been seeing the notice that Lori put up that there would be a special guest, a surprise tonight. And it is my distinct honor and pleasure to welcome Peter Lavenda to the first Earth Files YouTube channel in which we are really going to talk about some fascinating subjects that he is working on both in To the Stars and his own extraordinary work. And we're going to be talking about how the nonfiction side feeds into the fiction side. And right now, we were worrying that we might have hail at this moment. And we've decided we're going to go forward and you'll hear it. It'll get loud and then maybe soft. We're going to try to work around this uh, another Albuquerque uh, storm. Once upon a time, it was a desert here and it's beginning to be a little bit more like a monsoon tropical <laughs> island. <laughs> but with that, and because you all need to be introduced to Peter Lavenda in not only the work he's doing for To The Stars, but the work that he is doing in his fiction. I feel that this is one of the most important subjects that we could possibly be joining together tonight. In order for Earth Files YouTube channel to periodically, when there really is important work and we can talk with the author, that this will be fun to do on the Earth Files YouTube channel. So with that, I'm going to ask Peter to just stand by for a few minutes and I'm going to give you some news updates that I am actually surprised that I'm returning yet again to animal mutilations. And the reason is because they keep persisting. And now I've got a whole new area of the world. And that if I and a few others will continue to keep reporting what is actually happening, maybe some kind of government offices will begin to more seriously address the fact that bloodless animal mutilations persist around this planet. Now, for those of you who have been here the uh, last three uh, weeks, I have reported about all of the cat mutilations up in Thurston County, which is in the Olympia, Washington area. And it was last Thursday on uh, August 30th. They had the 13th reported inside of Thurston County. And now I'm hearing that there are even more mutilated cats in the Houston, Texas area. I know that there, the number now in the greater London is about 500 plus, And that uh, in Argentina, they keep sending me emails there and photographs and I'm gonna keep trying to do updates on the absolutely pristine, bloodless, trackless animal mutilations. So think tonight that the news going in at the first week of September of 2018 is about unexplained, bloodless animal mutilations and that we are going to be going into discussions with Peter on his work on the fiction and the and nonfiction side in which the heart of it would be non-human intelligences provoking portals on our planet in order to get here with the goal of creating hybridized bodies for work that is not comprehensible to us. So in a very strange way, as we start tonight, there is a blend of the news where we're going with Peter Lavenda and a very surprising place I opened up emails today, and here is what I found. Uh, this is reported from the Australian Broadcasting Company, quote, dead cows found in paddock with udders, ears, and tongues removed. Headline, close quote. It's ABC News in Australia reporting that ranchers Mick and Judy Cook were, quote, working on their property in Cloverly, northwest of Mackay when they noticed a dead cow carcass, which appeared to have had its body mutilated with its entire udder, ears, and tongue removed. The photographs at the ABC website show the clean excisions that have no blood or fluid. Mr. Cook told the Australian television network, quote, it was like the udders, ears, and tongue had been surgically reported 
and that and removed and I certainly couldn't do as neat a job with a very sharp knife and it definitely was not an animal I saw the body parts missing there was no blood even where the parts had been removed no sign of struggle just dead close quote Local McKay veterinarian David Lemon told the ABC network that in his 40 years working in the cattle industry, he had never seen anything like this bloodlessly mutilated cow. He said, I deal with creatures great and small, and I can't think of any explanation for what we are looking at, close quote. Australia has also had a series of reports in 2018 of mutilated wallabies, kangaroos, and even a koala bear on the far southwest coast of Victoria, where a ko koala was discovered with its ears cut off. No bleeding. Earlier this year, a young wallaby was found with its head, the entire head, beheaded like the animals in London. And this was southeast of Adelaide. Bloodless animal mutilations were also the subject of my May 25, 1980, Emmy Award-winning TV documentary, A Strange Harvest, that was broadcast in Denver, Colorado. That's where law enforcement told me, largely off the record, quote, the perpetrators of the animal mutilations are creatures from outer space, close quote. But why, since the 1960s, why would creatures from outer space be harvesting ears, eyes, tongue, jaw flesh, sexual organs, rectal and other tissues from cattle, horses, and all sorts of domestic farm animals and exotic creatures such as koala bears. And then there are the mutilated wild deer, wild elk, foxes, rabbits, reindeer. All of this happening in both hemispheres of our planet. After that 90-minute broadcast that I did, A Strange Harvest, I started hearing from hundreds of people and getting hundreds of phone calls. And everybody started, I've never told anyone this before, and then I would hear about animal mutilations or encounters with entities or human abductions. And some people were saying, I've seen a beam come down out of something that was round and glowing in the sky and come down into a pasture. And sometimes they would see an animal coming down that they would find later mutilated, or the animal would be going up in the beam. Well, not long after the broadcast of A Strange Harvest, I got a call from a man who identified himself as an engineer from Martin Marietta. He had information, he said, that he wanted to share with me that linked to my investigations of animal mutilations UFOs and ETs. He came to my Denver office and told me that in the 1970s he had worked on a construction project in Sedona, Arizona, in which a small, all brick, imagine, the ceiling, the floors, the walls, everything was brick. No windows and no doors. And this was built at a very specific latitude and longitude. He sketched for me a technology that he said was placed inside that small all brick building that was designed to counteract a natural collapse, listen to this, to counteract a natural collapse of magnetic fields at that latitude and longitude that would open up if they were not blocked that that magnetic collapse would open up a portal gateway in the magnetic fields in the fabric of space-time. He said non-human intelligences in this universe and beyond in other dimensions can use such magnetic field collapses to move point to point in this cosmos, compressing light years of distance to a few minutes. But what could come through those gateway portals from another dimension might not be a friend to humans. Okay, so that was in the early 80s. Last night, on September 4th, 2018, George Knapp at Channel 8 in Las Vegas, Nevada, tweeted this, quote, 
the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Project, and that's ATIP, linked to the Bigelow Aerospace Advanced Space Studies Group, known as BAS. Research was sabotaged about a decade ago and then defunded, lost its funding, in large part because of a cabal of religious fundamentalists inside the national security apparatus of the United States that do not believe UFOs, that do believe that UFOs and the paranormal are satanic and that by studying them, we risk inviting Satan into our world. Close quote, George Knapp, Channel 8, Las Vegas, tweet last night. The Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Project that George Knapp is referencing was first made public on December 16, 2017, when the New York Times headlined on its front page above the fold what we've been talking about for months, Glowing Auras and Black Money, the Pentagon's Mysterious UFO Program, and had the release of those infrared videos in the uh, jets. Now... Since then, the former director of ATIP, Louis Elizondo, has joined rock star Tom DeLong's To The Stars organization, and their goal is to build a bridge between the white world science and technology that has been deliberately kept out of UFO technology back engineering investigations by the alleged American secret space program that began in the 1950s because of the UFO phenomenon. This is a very important step. If two of the stars can do this, if two of the stars and the scientists that are working with them can get the black world science into the white world, this will be a huge achievement. Everybody who is involved with investigating UFOs realizes that non-disclosure agreements and compartmentalization in the black world has limited what the white world has known, and to the stars, Tom DeLong, Peter Lavenda, Louis Elizondo, Steve Justice, and all of that group are really trying something that is significant and important. Let's get the white world up to speed. Now, George Knapp's tweet last night is saying that the Bigelow Aerospace ATIP funding a decade ago was undermined politically and then its funding canceled by, quote, a cabal of religious fundamentalists worried that studying UFOs will bring Satan into our world. That Satan connection to UFOs and non-human intelligences that George Knapp referenced last night has been deeply studied by author and To The Stars collaborator, Peter Lavenda, my guest tonight. Since 1979, Peter has traveled to Chile and Southeast Asia and many other places in his own personal effort to find the facts and find the truth and trying to get documents and images and firsthand testimonies from people who link Adolf Hitler to and his special Nazi forces in Germany to the presence of an alien intelligence that some believe is dark, dangerous, and evil. Peter Lavenda is the author of 16 books that include Unholy Alliance, A History of Nazi Involvement with the Occult, released in 1995, and Sinister Forces, A Grimoire of American Political Witchcraft, released in 2004. In those books, Peter Lavenda writes about the sinister forces, such as alien intelligences from someplace else in the cosmos that knew how to move and know how to move through dimensions and time in order to have access to our planet Earth. A year ago, Peter began a series of three nonfiction books for Tom DeLong and To The Stars, and the first release in March of 2017 was entitled Secret Machines, Gods, Volume One of Gods, Man and War. The second and third nonfiction volumes 
in the Secret Machine ser series will be released over the next couple of years. Peter is, has one done, and we're going to talk a little bit about it tonight. And the third one he still has to do, but he's working on the nonfiction trilogy for To the Stars. Now, in this work, we're going to be talking on parallels tonight, the nonfiction and the fiction, because Peter says that the series that he's working on that deals in the fiction side that echoes the nonfiction references the use of magic rituals to open portals for alien gods to enter our planet in order to harvest DNA and to manipulate genes for the creation of hybrids, part alien and part homo sapien. And that is the heart of the UFO phenomena on Earth. That same revelation about magic rituals and UFOs opening portals so alien so-called gods can enter our planet to produce genetic creations is also the thread that weaves through another fiction trilogy that Peter Lavenda is working on. The first book in the trilogy is The Lovecraft Code. The book flap states, quote, a mysterious unit of America's clandestine security apparatus, like the NSA and the CIA, has discovered evidence that a new brand of terror is on the rise, a cult that worships an alien god and seeks to resurrect a religion that was old when the world was young. Close quote. Then, the next book in the trilogy that was just released in July of 2018, and I can tell you, is remarkable. It starts out inside the mind of a human abductee. And what Peter is able to do with weaving the voices of that which is alien and that which is human, trying to understand what is happening with the whole genetic under uh, framing for what could be the reason that non-humans are interacting with our planet. It is extraordinary. This is an amazing book. And it is, uh, the, the best combination is to read the Lovecraft Code and then go to Dunwich. And all of Peter's work, all 16 books, are available at Amazon.com. I could not recommend any, any books with more uh, enthusiasm because Peter and To The Stars are recognizing that it is this issue, like the Martin Marietta engineer, being able to manipulate magnetic fields that cause some kind of distortion in magnetic fields that open up portals that are used by other intelligences on our planet. Now, this same revelation about magic rituals and UFOs opening portals so alien so-called gods can enter our planet is the theme of what he's trying to work on. And as we go forward now, that in Dunwich, this new book that just came out in July of 2018, Dunwich is the name of a fictional town in Massachusetts used by American writer H.P. Lovecraft in his 1928 original short story, and Peter has studied Lovecraft. He can, Peter connects really complex layers of human obsession over centuries with magical rites, and he presents magic as technology used by outside sinister forces in order to open up these space-time portals so that human procreation can be used to create alien-human hybrids for reasons unknown. And the only way to stop the abuse of innocent human beings is to block those portal gateways. Tonight, I want you, all of you, to give a, a warm welcome in the digital world to Peter Lavenda. I am so happy to have you here. You. And he has agreed 
that in the last 15 minutes of the show, we will open your questions tonight to Peter. So to start off, because this is what really intrigues me, he has a brilliant mind, he is a brilliant writer, he is tackling these extremely difficult subjects and weaving them three nonfiction books, his own three fiction, but common to both is the whole question. What are the themes, the fundamental themes in the To The Stars, Secret Machines, nonfiction that you felt that you wanted to put into a trilogy of fiction and what is it that you can put in fiction that you might not be able to write about in the nonfiction? Well, those are very good questions, and they really go to the heart of the matter that we're discussing. Uh, one of the themes that uh, is introduced in Secret Machines Gods is the idea that religion uh, and science on Earth may be a kind of cargo cult, that at some point in our distant past, we had contact with an alien entity, an alien force of some kind. And this caused a kind of trauma. Uh, they came here and then they left, whoever they were. And we began to reorganize our societies around that idea. We began to look to the stars, quite literally. Could I ask just quickly, would you at least guide the audience to consider the possibility that that which came left a homo sapien human civilization in trauma might be the Anunnaki or the Sumerian? Well, the Sumerians talk about this. Whether or not it's Anunnaki specifically is a different thing, but the Sumerians obviously talk about having the gods come to earth and then the gods abandoning them. Uh, one of the famous prayers of the ancient Sumerians, we're talking Sumer 3000 BCE roughly, uh, the prayer was, spirit of the sky, remember the high priests were begging the gods to come back down from the stars to the earth. So the Sumerians believed that. The Egyptians believed that their pharaohs would actually travel to the stars after the mummification process. They would ride on a boat to the North Star, to the Pole Star. So there was this idea that there's a connection between humans and the stars, and that there was a possibility, framed by them in religious terms, to travel from earth to the stars. And that might have been a soul travel, as the uh, Egyptian pharaohs would, would, right. would do, or it might be something more immediate that humans could possibly do. And is this where magic gets inserted into the relationship of humans to gods? Magic is a technology. One thing I've learned for studying this subject since the 1960s, quite literally, is that magic, I've learned, is a kind of technology. It's a consciousness technology. Uh, it's always framed in very spooky terms in the popular media, uh, and rightly so. There's a lot of very strange people out there doing magic or claiming to do it. But actually, if you really parse it down and you, you take it apart, you see it's a consciousness technology. It's a way of attuning our own brains and our own minds to see something that should be visible to us and is not, to sense entities, to sense presences that are there which we don't normally sense. Um, and to make that kind of contact. Magic is a reordering of nature, a reordering of reality around us to make that hole, that opening, that gate, in order for us to travel to an astral kind of reality. We know that Jack Parsons was the first director of the Jet Propulsion Lab that has worked so closely with NASA for a very long time. And there are, is a book and these stories about how Jet uh, the uh, JPL director, Jack Parsons, used magical ritual. And I thought that he was following the footsteps of Aleister Crowley to try to get an ET to come literally from someplace else into this matter world by doing the Babylon and these other rituals. And when we were talking about this, uh, you had another insight about what he was trying to do. And can you explain, because I think this is confusing, could it be that JPL and NASA were founded with the idea that they were going to have to block portals or open portals to deal with non-human intelligences interacting with Earth? How much time do you have? <laughs> um, we got at least a half hour. Yeah. 
Jack Parsons is a special study of mine for a long time. Jack Parsons was not just the director of the JPL, he was one of the founders of the JPL. In fact, they used to joke that JPL stood for Jack Parsons Laboratory. He was that identified with that operation. He was one of our earliest rocket scientists, a literal rocket scientist. And he was brilliant, obviously. He was very much part of our, our program, uh, our military program during World War II. He was extremely important, a key player in all of that. But at the same time, he was also a very deep, dedicated occultist, a very serious occultist. Not a sort of dabbler or new age tarot card kind of occultist, but somebody who actually was using ritual magic to contact other entities. And is it fair for all of us now who are trying to follow these developments of back engineering to the stars, uh, science actually getting now into the UFO field, that the whole bottom line on how you could manipulate magnetic fields and possibly open up a portal has to do with frequencies. And that frequencies has to do with sound and repetition. And that a lot of magic, black or white, has had to do with sound or repetition of sound and getting frequencies that will cause something to happen. Well, that's true on an individual uh, level. For instance, an individual occult practitioner would use sound and, uh, and rhythm in order to alter his or her consciousness to, to, to open a kind of a gateway in their mind to the place where they want to go. It happens in group rituals. It happens in Afro-Caribbean cults, for instance, and religions that use drums, a lot of drumming and a lot of repetition. It happens in India with the recitation of the mantra. All of these manipulations of sound are very important. So when you manipulate sound and you know what you're doing, you're actually starting to create uh, a, a bond between your conscious mind and the autonomic nervous system, the system in the body that controls breathing, heartbeat, and a lot of other functions we don't normally think about. The idea is we're trying to get into the unconscious, we're trying to break the bond between our normal waking material world and another world that exists deep in our unconscious mind. Now, we're using those terms today, but in the old days they didn't talk conscious and unconscious, they taught this world and the next. They taught this world and the underworld, uh, this world and the astral plane, for instance. They had different terminology. Today we're using conscious and unconscious. Tomorrow it will be something else. But basically there are two worlds, and we're trying to breach the wall that separates the two, and that, which, that is what gives the magician magical power. And that what we may not have understood is that magnetic fields are a key to the entire portal gateway and that you've got to be able to either collapse magnetic fields or do something that manipulates magnetic fields to artificially open up a portal that somehow connects to another part of the universe. Well, I'll give you some examples because uh, we can speculate, but actually we have examples that prove it. And one of our earliest examples is in ancient Egypt. The mummification process involved the use of a device which was shaped in a very odd shape. It was called an ads in English, but it was a, a, a metallic uh, instrument made of meteoric iron that was magnetic. They didn't understand what magnetism oh. was, but this was used to open the mouth of the mummy, which was to enable the mummy to speak. So there was this idea of magnetism and sound being related, the ability to talk. It was shaped like the what we call the Big Dipper today. It was shaped like that constellation. They understood there was a relationship there because the Big Dipper points to the North Star, which was where the Pharaoh was going to go. Fast forward thousands of years, and now we're in the Czech Republic. And there was a famous magician there called Franz Bardon. And Franz Bardon used magical wands that he developed for his occult rituals that had magnets at either end. He also understood the use of magnetism in occult ritual. There's something very strange about how a magnet works. It seems to have an invisible power. The Chinese used a magnet, not necessarily for navigation, but their magnet in their scryers, or uh, not scryer, geomancer's compass, was a method of finding out where the energy in the earth led, where to build a building. And the magnet was very important. It's in the center of that disk. So there's this association with the ancient peoples, and especially spirituality and spiritual practices, with magnetism itself. It's an unconscious 
uh, recognition that there is a link there. And now let's jump to science today. We are beginning to be much more sophisticated about the fact that we're in a universe in which quantum, whether it's quantum at the photon level, quantum at the conscious level, but that entanglement of photons from one end to the other is probably one of the binding, we'll call it underpinnings of everything that happens in the universe, but still gravity and magnetic fields, the relationship between entanglement and magnetic fields and what, what will make gravity go away if you're gonna move point to point. This is all seeming to come down to this issue that we haven't understood that if you can change the shape of magnetic fields, if you can do, I'm going to say, make that collapse, that that is a key to beginning to work with the fabric of space-time that will lead to these portal gates. Now, some people say to me in the whistleblower camp now that they already have been doing time travel, uh, we have been going point to point with the help of an alien species. In all of the work and everything that you've been exposed to, do you have any sense that we are not only trying to bridge the black, dark space world with the white world now, trying to heal this huge uh, disconnect, but that we actually could have space travel because we are working with an ally an alien intelligence that is helping us get out while on the Earth we're still trying to get to that headline, we're not alone in the universe. Well, there's a lot there to discuss. Um, in terms of electromagnetism, as we know, that's one of the four forces, the four basic forces, strong nuclear force, weak nuclear force, gravity, and electromagnetism. If there is a unified field theory, which we don't have yet. And we've got thunder. We've got thunder, <laughs> speaking of electromagnetism. <laughs> If, if there's a unified field theory, then the, the effect on any one of those four forces should have a corresponding effect on the others in some way, whether it's uh, through just the pure math of it, whether it's through exerting a force in one direction and getting a reaction in another. So we know that electromagnetism is one of the basic forces in the universe. So if there's going to be time travel, if there's going to be anything like that, electromagnetism would have to be involved in some way or another, either defeating it or using it, but one way or the other it has to be involved. Um, I think in terms of making the contact and having maybe another intelligence guiding us or being involved in this, well, like George Knapp pointed out, um, the fear of that was very real among a lot of people. Uh, it doesn't even begin with ATIP or, or the Bigelow uh, operation. Much earlier than that, in the remote viewing days in the 1970s, 1980s, there was a lot of pushback in, in some, among some members of Congress who thought that remote viewing was a form of witchcraft, and they wanted to pull the funding from those programs as well, which I believe they did for the most part. Some of it went underground. But even remote viewing, you know, even mental telepathy, essentially, was considered tantamount to, to witchcraft. So we have, in this country, a kind of pushback against using these technologies or understanding these technologies because of fears that there is a kind of spiritual component to it that we don't understand or can't control. So you have two forces at work. You know, those who want to use this stuff, those who know this may be the key to understanding reality, and those who say, you don't want to do this, uh, the Bible says not to do it, let's close it down. Now, can you take the Earth File viewers into this fascinating area that you are really, truly working in very complex and important layers, that we could be dealing with intelligences that manipulate in order for humans to do magic, to open up a portal that they can come through because what they want more than anything else is the harvest of genetic material or the manipulation of procreation here in order to create hybrids for unknown reasons. I'm sorry, we've run out of time. <laughs> um, okay, basically, sure. We can get into that. I mean, that's something that um, I've discussed in the, in the fiction books because it's easier sometimes to talk about these things in a narrative form than it is in a purely uh, nonfiction scientific way. There's, there's a problem because the, 
the science and the, the historical end of it is dense. There's just no question about it. And to explain... Dense meaning it's very difficult to understand yes. because you need uh, 10 PhDs uh, to understand uh, DNA sequencing and what is happening when they talk about there's no antecedent. If they've done right. a genome sequencing, there's no antecedent. That means that it, it doesn't go back through the normal homo sapien bloodline. All of that is part of our come. Yes, and <laughs> he really there. gets into this in Dunwich. Okay, so explain. Shameless plug, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, dense because the science itself we're at the point now where you can't be a Renaissance man or a Renaissance woman as back in the day because in those days you could kind of learn all the sciences, right? You, you could be an expert in art, culture, you know, and, and science. Today that's impossible. That even within a single field of scientific right. endeavor, you're going to specialize in one little corner and not know what the other guy's doing. So you have the, the problem is the math is extremely formidable. You're talking about you know, advanced forms of calculus that we haven't even thought of in the regular world in, in trig classes in high school or college. And artificial intelligence. No. This is the field that needs it. That means independent algorithms and that we get into that issue. That's so ironic that as we are now trying to go forward and break into the white world with science that is coming out of back engineering UFOs and dealing with ET bodies and, and DNA. Well, even the that, white world science is so formidable by itself. Yeah. We it, don't understand it. But, but think about yeah. that maybe 70% of what we've been interacting with as grays and whatever they are, are artificial intelligence coming from other intelligent systems, and we haven't even met the prime intelligence yet. That would be in Secret Machines, man, coming, out, <laughs> coming to your library soon. Yeah, every time I bring up the questions, he, what he's dealing with between the nonfiction books and the fiction books, it's all woven. Yeah, it's all woven together. And the reason is, this was not deliberate on my part. I've just been doing this for so long that the historical stuff and the scientific stuff and then the, the occult or the esoteric stuff all you know, was feeding one into the other. So that's been going on for me for a, for a long time. I'm trying to the Nazis and the occult doesn't make any sense, except that it was true, and they were involved. And the documents are there; you can find it out for yourself, and it's it's all there and bibliographies everywhere. So we know they were doing this. We know that a state in the 20th century, a government composed of the German people, who were really brilliant people, philosophers, scientists, engineers, had an entire division that was like specializing in occult research. So there is something there. Everyone acknowledges that there is a connection between the two. And when you say that they had a division that was focused on occult research mm -hmm. and take what we've talked about so far having to do with magic ritual that could range from the Babylon experiment that Jack Parsons did to now are trying to find frequencies to make magnetic fields be manipulated, what would the Germans have been doing before and during World War II that would fall into this category of manipulating space, time, and matter in some kind of an occult way? Well, what happened was once the, the Nazi party got control of Germany and Heinrich Himmler became the head of the SS, he had unlimited funds at his disposal. So he created a division called the Andenerba, which was the Ancestral Heritage Research Division. And this was the occult department. And what they did is they went after everything they could find on every continent on the planet, in every culture, to see what their occult uh, culture was. What did they have? What texts did they have? Who were their, their important shamans? Who were their important uh, occultists? So they gathered them all together and put them all to work trying to find out, pen to penetrate some of these secrets in a very deliberate way. The problem was, of course, it was very ideological. So there was a racist component to the entire process that basically eliminated entire areas of study they could have found useful, and instead they focused in another area. But Give an example. Well, of course, because of their racist policies, anything that came from the Jews or the Gypsies, two groups with large mystical uh, uh, cultures, was eliminated. They just didn't follow that. They didn't, they didn't pay attention. They kind of paid attention to Freemasonry, they had a Freemasonry museum, 
and the guy who started his career at the SS at the Freemasonry Museum as the curator was Adolf Eichmann. So wow. you, you see the connection between this rabid sort of uh, uh, military Aryan superiority, you know, extreme fascist kind of mentality and an interest in occultism and ritual magic. Now, what, is there any example that you know of that was definitive where they said, if you do X ritual, you will be able to access Y portal that will take you to Aldebaran or someplace in the universe? Well, not exactly, because those documents don't survive. And the people, more importantly, did not survive. But we know they considered certain parts, certain places in the world to be more powerful and more potent than other places, which suggests immediately these were kind of gateways to some spiritual reality. So, An example? An example is the Echternstein in Germany, which is a pagan uh, uh, shrine that has uh, weird carvings in, in, in stone and all and runic symbols and that sort of thing. But uh, there were other sites in uh, Scandinavia that they were looking at particularly. And they even called their, the, the first occult operation that gave birth to the Nazi party was something called the Tula Gesellschaft, the Thule Society. And Thule meant uh, a mystical place in the far north, in the ice and snow, where the, their origin was, where the Aryan people came from. And they brought their supernormal powers with them. The man who worked for Heinrich Himmler at the SS Annenerbe was a guy called uh, uh, Weisko. Uh, he was a really weird guy. Uh, he had been in a mental institution for a while. But then Himmler picked, plucked him out, and Weistor, or, or Villiger was his name, depending upon who he was talking to. And he claimed that he could see telepathically and memorize and, and have a, a consistent memory of every year of the German race going back 10,000 years. So he could tell Himmler what was going on 5,000, 6,000 years ago, what forms of magic they used, what forms of religion they had, how to contact the gods, uh, what the runic symbols meant and how to use that to, to contact other realities. This is an excellent point to ask this question. We're now in 2018 where Antarctica, as is being described by whistleblowers and some really serious whistleblowers, as having ancient archaeology two miles under ice that includes pyramids, includes composite material that uh, has been studied by our government in the United States and is not recognizable as the way, meaning it's from someplace else, not here, um, that there are hieroglyphs, that there are symbols, structures, large, all down two miles, and that some of the whistleblowers who have physically been there or seen photos say that the hieroglyphs and the structure and the colors and the forms match what they have been shown in photographs or film on or in the moon that match hieroglyphs, pyramids, and ancient archaeology on Mars. Some of these people are really serious. I know because I've seen some of their documentation in the military. And what intrigues me is that this kind of rumor, whether we've gone all the way back to Anunnaki or we're talking now about the Nazis, is the idea that there has been a long time relationship between something that did not originate on Earth or in this solar system, but has been using, past, present, future, has been using or was using planetary systems in our solar system, including the Earth and Antarctica. With that as the 2018 big question, of all the things that you've been exposed to in Germany, because you've really studied the Nazis, is there anything there having to do with Aldebaran or anything that might tie to an actual ancient archaeological site two miles underground in Antarctica? Well, we know, for instance, in 1938, the Nazis sent an expedition to Antarctica. There's a problem with that story, and the, the problem is that in 1938, Germany was gearing up for World War II, basically. The following year, they were going to invade Czechoslovakia, Poland, and start the whole thing going. So they needed every dime they could get. Germany had been impoverished during the Depression, like most of the rest of the world. And they were getting money from various sources, from industrialists, and even from the United States. 
and they were building up their war machine. Why they would spend all that money to send an expedition to Antarctica is very strange. It's almost a, a waste of money, basically, for a country that's getting ready to invade all of its neighbors. Which says there's another reason we never Which have been told. another reason we don't know, yeah. So they went down there, they planted flags, and you know, Nazi flags, little swastikas everywhere, and they came back. And as far as we know, they never went back. However, in the 1950s, uh, a guy up in Canada began publishing stories about flying saucer bases in Antarctica, maybe Hitler you know, escaped to Antarctica, all these, these stories. But they were fiction as they were published. But then later, people really took all of that to heart, and he kind of switched tact, and he said, oh, yes, this is really true. This was all really happening. That started this whole craze of Hitler, the Nazis, UFOs. But Richard Byrd. Well, Richard Byrd didn't see Nazis and UFOs. No, but he, they yeah. went, uh, on, he went on uh, that, uh, uh, the project... Uh, uh, high Jump. High Jump. Yeah. And that it was supposed to go for a certain period of time, and it, he stopped and came back uh, only a couple of months in. And the rumors started that they encountered silver disks or some kind of aerial objects that, like a war, and that that was the true reason that Richard Byrd came out of Antarctica early. Well, that was a rumor. The problem is that the fact is the, 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 data that we, the data that we have is really important because the data shows, yes, they went down there with an enormous convoy. Again, didn't make any sense. World War II was just over. This convoy goes down when they're trying to shut down the Navy. They're trying to, re they're trying to cut down the costs. Truman was desperate to save money. So suddenly, for, for some reason that makes no sense to anyone, we decide to finance this entire convoy. And we do it with a lot of unskilled, untrained personnel as well. We do it without the proper equipment. Stuff breaks down, mysterious things happen, and everybody says, you know, we have to get out of here. This isn't working. They turn around. And people died on that expedition. And there's never been a full accounting of it. There's a lot of books on Operation High Jump, but they don't really answer some of the critical questions. Just like the Nazi expedition, it didn't, didn't make any sense. The Operation High Jump expedition also made no sense. And just to add a little bit more of color to all of this, one of the people who was on that mission, Operation High Jump, was an American SS officer. He was an American who had belonged to the SS during the war, owed his loyalty to, to Adolf Hitler. And he came back to the United States after High Jump. He never talked about Operation High Jump. But he did get involved with the mother of Lee Harvey Oswald after the assassination and became her literary agent, among other things. But he was a contact point between the Nazi underground that survived the war and the American Nazi movements and the, the extreme right movements in the United States. He was kind of the pivot to something that we normally call Odessa, an underground Nazi uh, network that existed in Europe, uh, Latin America, and other parts of the world. So you have, once again, this Nazi connection to uh, an expedition to Antarctica, what was going on there. But the point I really wanted to make by going back to the Canadian guy making up the stories, Lovecraft, just bringing him back in by the back door, Lovecraft actually believed, or he wrote in his stories anyway, that the artists and the writers, the musicians, the creative people are the first ones to know about what's really going on. They're the first ones to be in contact with the alien forces, let's say, the extraterrestrial Telepathy? Forces. A kind of telepathy. I mean, uh, it's telepathic communication. It's the best way we have of describing that now. But they, they see it in dreams. They see it in vision, in visions, and they try to recreate what they're seeing. A little bit like Close Encounters of the Third Kind with the mashed potatoes. Right. Uh, Everybody that had had exposure that was getting some kind of dream or telepathic, they were making the Devil's Tower in mashed potatoes right. and drawing as if the uh, alien part wanted the people to be there, which then is the question. Aldebaran or Eldebaran is a sun that we wouldn't associate life with ne necessarily. What is your own personal opinion after all of the deep digging you have done about uh, Hitler? He in speeches, he even at one point mentioned Eldebaran or, or having some kind of a help from celestial visitors for what he was trying to do. Well, Hitler, I don't know. Hitler um, was in his early years in Vienna uh, in between you know, poverty 
uh, he was living as, a, as an artist or trying to make a living as an artist. And he spent the money that he had, which was not much, on occult magazines. Uh, we know the magazine. It was called Ostara. And it was published by a guy called Hans von Liebenfels, who was the leader of a group called the Order of the New Templars. And he was a Catholic priest who had left the church and created this mystical society and started publishing this magazine. Hitler was an avid reader of that. He actually went to the offices of Ostara to talk to Hans, uh, Lanz von Liebenfels to try to get a deeper understanding of, of the occult origins of all this stuff that he was sucking in. He actually was a fanatic for Wagnerian opera. And you know, Wagnerian opera, especially the ring cycle and all of that is extremely mystical. Uh, plays with the gods coming to earth and fighting it out and all the rest of it. And this was how Hitler was, was brought up, basically. This was his, his thing. Not, not to say that Hitler was an active occultist, because I don't think he would have taken orders from anybody in any secret society. But on his own, he pursued this type of information. There were occult books in his library at Berchtesgaden at the end of the war. So he was involved in it, but I don't think he was an active, you know, hands-on participant. But the, the scientists who went under Operation Paperclip to help start NASA, to get back to a question from many years ago, <laughs> is that the, they believed in alien technology, the alien presence. Uh, the people who worked there, I mean, from Werner von Braun, who made a couple of very right. cryptic comments, to Hermann Oberth, who said, yes, there's you know, flying saucers and other life and other planets. These are guys that we're, we've given the keys to NASA to, right? And they believed in it. And the, and the guys at JPL, like Jack Parsons, but some of his other fellow uh, uh, scientists also believed it. Parsons himself saw a UFO and recorded it. So, I mean, we know that these people were conscious of that. Magic and science running parallel is exactly what I was writing about in the first To the Stars book in Secret Machines Gods, the idea that our science and our religion really are being um, inspired by the same desire to get off planet and to go to the stars. And in that magic and science coming together, why do you think that Adolf Hitler was obsessed with a tall, blonde, blue-eyed race taking over the earth? Especially because he was short and dark. And he wanted to eliminate all of the Jews. Mm -hmm. So what, what do you think? Why was he obsessed? about tall, blonde, blue-eyed. And the back of that question is, in the human abduction syndrome for the last 70 years or so have been that there are three competing geopolitical territorial non-humans, tall blondes, reptilians, and the ebons that come in all kinds of sizes and gray skins and heads, and that there is a geopolitical conflict three-way, and that the blondes have been fighting the reptiles for eons. Well, I can't really address that directly. All I can say is that on this planet, we're doing exactly the same thing. On this planet, we have races at each other's throats. We have cultures at each other's throats. Um, we're reenacting in our world what you're suggesting is taking place on, on another kind of reality, another, another dimension around us. Uh, Hitler's fascination with this uh, goes back to, again, to, to occultism. It goes back to that magazine, to Ostara, which had depictions of Jews as these ugly little Charles Manson-like creatures who were trying to defile tall, blonde, Nordic German women and ruin the race, right? So this was in occult magazines, right? Ostara was an occult magazine. It talked about Nordic uh, religion, Teutonic religion, that sort of thing. It talked about runes and it talked about all of this as being the Germans have being the repository of this ancient magical tradition. So Hitler is seeing this and he's making those connections. He didn't like Jewish people in the first place. We know that from Mein Kampf. He wrote about that. He was upset by it. He thought they were alien people living in his culture, in his country. And that's the term that we use, isn't it? We use alien for people that are not us. So we can project that onto an, another race from another planet or another dimension. And suddenly that word use becomes identified in our minds with something objectionable, something we don't like, something we have to be afraid of. We don't have any other terminology in English that makes it more comfortable for us to talk about other people in a nice way. So going back to that then, to your original question, because I go off in tangents, as you know, um, there is 
a genetic component to all of this. And I talk about that in the book that's coming up with, the t with Tom DeLonge with uh, Secret Machines Man. Secret Machines Man is about the scientific aspect of everything. The book, the first book was about religion and esotericism, spirituality. That was God's. The second volume is about us. And it's about science, it's about quantum mechanics, it's about genetics. There's a very long section on genetics. Trying to understand what it is about genetic manipulation that has to do with the ET presence. And going back to Francis Crick and to, to people of that nature, Francis Crick won the Nobel Prize for genetics because he discovered the DNA helix, along with Watson and Rosemary and all the others. So he believed that the genetic code did not arise naturally on this planet, that even our genes are alien, that the RNA was seeded here at some point in the distant past and gave rise to every kind of thing that evolved, multiplying like crazy, like a computer program designed to keep replicating, replicating, and replicating, and modifying itself, learning about its environment, creating new versions and new types. So if Francis Crick believed that the DNA and the RNA came from another planet, and he called it directed panspermia. Directed means intentionally planted on this earth. Right. Who did that? Exactly. And what does our DNA represent in us? What, where did it come from? What is it doing? What is it up to? It's possible the aliens are us. And 1999 December, I had a meeting with a man who was retiring from the Defense Intelligence Agency after 23 years. And he told me, quote unquote, Linda, World War II was an extraterrestrial war fought through human bodies and that the geopolitical conflict was between blondes, reptilians, and ebons. And if our government has had that context, which is also what William Mills Tompkins, who died uh, in the last year and had worked for the Navy as a young man and then had done a book, he had said the same thing, that from his perspective inside of the Navy in the United States, that there were three competing non-human groups that manipulate through mind, through telepathy, and through genetic manipulation and the creation of a hybridized race. And as we are coming to the point where I would like to turn the program over to questions, I would just like you to give me as fast as you, it comes into your head. Do you think that the current population of Homo sapiens sapien could be slowly being replaced by hybrids in a process that's been going on for perhaps millions of years on the earth, and that if hybridization is known and studied by our government secretly, it might be classified as a national security threat to the survival of Homo sapiens sapien and could explain why our government and others have been obsessed with secrecy when we all want to know the truth. We're out of time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, well, like this. Number one, if there's a hybridization program taking place, yes, that would be considered a national security threat, and no one's going to talk about it, and we hope someone's taking steps to understand it and see what the implications of that are. Number two, if our DNA is as I've suggested, planted here by some, someone else, and it's a program that's replicating and self-learning like an AI program, maybe the hybridization program is happening naturally. Maybe we're giving birth to our own hybrids. Maybe the DNA sections of it are being turned on and off uh, as a result of our environment, as a result of electromagnetic fields that we've created with our communication systems, as an example, uh, with pollution or whatever that we're reacting to all of this and we're actually creating our own hybrids in a sense. Um, we may be simply remembering a lot of this because as they found out recently, memories can also be encoded on DNA. So are there memories of being manipulated? Are there memories of ancient contact which is now coming right. out 
consciously and we're seeing it and we're reacting to it. There's all kinds of possibilities. And as long as there is still government secrecy on this, we're never going to know. And that's the problem. And I think it's, it, we need to know what they know. The problem is it's so compartmentalized right. in the national security apparatus, right? There's so much compartmentalization that one hand doesn't know what the other hand is doing or one hand doesn't know what the other hand knows. And we need to, to kind of break that logjam and get somebody talking. Right. And I think if that can happen, and it's gradually starting to happen, as you know, then we're going to get to a place where we can start making educated guesses, not just about our society and our culture, but about our own lives. What do we do as human beings, as individuals? How do we react to this information? What steps can we take? Uh, to prepare ourselves for the changes that might be coming. And we have to, if we're going to remain a democracy, the American public has to put itself back in the position as of, by, and for the people and driving and demanding that we be told the truth and that this transition of what To the Stars is trying, what scientists are trying, is to get what has been dark and off the public grid yeah into the, um, well, say, the white world, because if that doesn't happen, then all of us are weakened by ignorance. And if Earth Files, you, your brilliant work, if there is one common denominator now, it is we've got to strengthen human knowledge in order to survive. And we have to do it because if we don't do it, some other country might do it, some other political organization may do it, some other corporation may do it. We need the power ourselves to, to make these intelligent decisions, and if we don't do it, someone else will. And you, who are my beloved uh, group out there of Earth Files, I wonder if, Lori, do we have some questions right now for Peter Lavenda? Absolutely we do, and if we can just say a quick thank you to Minnesota folks and Christine and Douglas and Michael and Carol and Mitchell and Thomas and Tate and Serge and Fabian. We've had so much great support tonight. Oh, thank and, you. Uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody. And I really hope that everybody who has been here tonight will give me feedback uh, about uh, doing this um, sort of like a uh, radio TV interview for Earth Files YouTube channel with the brilliant and great uh, Peter Lavenda and that eventually maybe we can do this on a monthly uh, basis and I would love your feedback but now Lori let's go to uh, a question for Peter. Great. So we do have some comments first. Uh, Mr. Lavenda, some people wanted to say thank you for your sound approach and thank you for your research. And our first question is, can you ask about Luis Elizondo's most recent talks? Basically, he all but states that there are other entities existing. So I'm curious what Linda and Peter think about Luis's activity lately. Good question. Yes. And I'm going to throw it to you. <laughs> Luis has not done a lot of public events, but he has done a few, and those he's done have been really high quality. I mean, he has really, uh, really gone to the edges of what he can really talk about in public, and he does. I mean, he, he has expressed this idea that we are not alone. That's why he was doing what he was doing with ATIP, and that's why he's uh, working with To The Stars right now, is because of this belief that there, the phenomenon is real. It is not uh, a speculation. It's not hallucinations or delusions. This is a real phenomenon. We have to understand it. And Luis is uh, right front and center on that. He's the guy who was inside. And Peter, he just in the last uh, day or two mm -hmm. uh, released that article that you and I have read today. Very good, very interesting. But he, again, he's stressing, and it is a stress. You can't uh, argue. I mean, not, don't mean you, but I mean it is, he's saying threat the word threat goes part and parcel with trying to understand the UFO phenomena and its relationship to our planet. Yeah, Luis, I mean, that was his job, right? He worked at the Pentagon. So uh, the Army treats, you know, every, he, the Army is a hammer and it treats every problem like a nail. So they're going to look at uh, UFOs and the phenomenon in general. Does this represent a national security threat? That's their job. They're not the State Department, they're not you know, the 
Department of Economics or anything else, that what they're doing is threat assessment, and that's what he did. So they have to as assume that there's a threat potential. Uh, that's to protect us, because if they're just ignoring the phenomenon, uh, that they would be dereliction of duty, basically. So they have to look at this as a threat. But that's the military-industrial complex. That's what they're going to do. That's their job. But we also have scientists who are not necessarily looking at it in terms of a threat. They want to understand it in terms of science, in terms of physics, chemistry, neurobiology, that sort of thing, genetics. So there's a lot of parallel tracks here to approach the UFO phenomenon, not just as a threat, but the military, of course, their job is to look at things as a threat, to understand, is it a threat? If so, can we defend against it? And that's what Luis was doing. Yeah. Okay, let's take another question. Great. Our next one is, what does Peter think is causing phenomenon does he believe it's them or us <laughs> i have a really smart great audience out there yeah well okay i'll try to answer that the best way i can um i've written books over the years and one trilogy that i wrote was called sinister forces and what i was trying to point out in that book is that history is not always what it seems and we can look at historical events and I use the Kennedy assassination as an example to show that an, an event like that is, is seen uh, almost a century in advance. It's anticipated by people in their writings, in, in creative work. There was a play written by a mystic, a Belgian mystic called Maurice Maeterlinck. And he wrote a play in which a king was assassinated. Not sure how many shots were fired, three, four, or five shots. The shots came from a grassy knoll. The guy claimed he was working for Russia, and his name was Alec. And Alec was the name Lee Harvey Oswald used to buy his famous man liquor, Carcano. So you have somebody writing around the turn of the century, before Jack Kennedy was even born, actually writing out the entire scenario. You know, things like that happen all the time. And there's, there's an occult and a mystical um, frame to our reality that we kind of ignore at our peril. It's, it's out there, it exists. There are connections that are made between events. We don't understand them. It's non-linear. It's not A, B, C, and D. It just goes all over the place the way we understand all over the place. But it's really consistent in other areas. That's what occultists try to do. That's what mystics try to do. They try to get to that point where they can see reality from on top and they can see where these connections are. But so, is it fair to say hmm. that you would agree that we are not the only life form in the universe and that there oh, that's are. Oh, not, that's not even a question. We're not the only life form in the universe. Are we visited by life forms from other planets? Are they from other dimensions? Um, are they us? You know, we are at the point now where in the next 20 years or so, our artificial intelligence will have advanced to such a degree and our creation of robots and androids and cyborgs will advance to such a degree, and our creation of flying craft will have advanced to such a degree, that we become the UFOs and we become the aliens. You know, what if the greys, as an example, are androids? You know, they're just machines. That's been brought up several times in different, different literature on UFO uh, uh, phenomena, that maybe the greys are machines. And if they're machines, who built the machines? And if time travel is possible, are they our machines? Or at some point, is it going to be almost impossible to tell us from the visitors? We're going to be so alike them that we're going to lose any, any sense of, dis, of distance. And the humans are moving towards cyborgism in order to go into space because this is a fragile body for space. And we're already contemplating how we are going to enhance humans that are going to go out into sure. space. And once that is started, we are looking at reflections in a mirror that ironically are who are non-humans? Are they from another planet or are they from a time in the future coming back? Exactly. So, uh, Lori, if we can do one more because it's about 8.30, the rain is starting again, but this has been so wonderful with Peter. I'd love to at least go another question. All right, here's a really good one. All right, Peter. What do you think about the relationship between ETs and demons? Do you believe that ETs are just ETs, or are they demons, or are they something together, or entirely different? Okay, I will try to answer that quickly. <laughs> um, 
I think, and I, I, I express this in the first Secret Machines book, that it's quite possible that our idea of angels, demons, gods, and all the rest of it was as a result of contact with something alien, something extraterrestrial. That people thousands of years ago used these terms to describe something they couldn't otherwise describe. They knew it was not human. That's the first thing. God, demon, angel, they're not human. So they're non-humans, just like aliens are non-humans. They have special powers like the aliens. They fly through the air like the aliens. So there's a lot of crossover there, and it may be that it's all one and the same. But demons and angels is kind of a value judgment. Some of the angels in the Old Testament and some of the other writings uh, around that time, they're not that nice people, are they? I mean, some of the angels are really fierce and mean, you know, and nasty. So, but they're on the side of God, so they must be good, and the demons are on the side of the devil, they must be evil. These are, you know, ways that we've tried to understand this interaction with humans and, and the other. So I think that we don't have enough information yet, but the terms are kind of confusing us. We have to back away from some of that, uh, the terminology, and try to look at the phenomenon on its own terms without projecting too much on them. The aliens may be uh, hostile. They may be enemies in some case. They may be manipulating us, treating us like uh, objects or slaves or cattle. That's possible. Um, does that mean they're demons, though? We treat animals badly. We do all kinds of things like that to other people. We treat other people badly. We wouldn't want to consider ourselves demons, though. So it's, it's really complicated, and I, I don't have an easy answer for it. But I do think that the people who worked in the, the technology field that I call magic, or the magic field that I call technology, were getting to that point of understanding. We're, you know, the, they were making contact. And in, especially in the last hundred years or so, the contact was not that straightforward. We, they didn't say demons, and they didn't say angels. They were really looking at entities with specific powers, abilities, and weird personalities. So it kind of transcended the demon angel idea. And God's Man and War. This was the first volume, and you have completed the second one, right? Yes. Explain that title and just the essence of where it goes from here and ends for, before the third. Okay, Secret Machines, Man is the second volume. This is God's, the second volume is Man. The third volume will be called War. Man is about um, the scientific uh, basis for how we uh, interpret the phenomenon. So there's sections on genetics, on quantum mechanics, quantum consciousness, uh, for instance. We look at the morphology of aliens as uh, abductees and contactees have described them. We try to see if there's clues as to their environment. If we look at a gray, for instance, they have really big eyes. Uh, they have almost no ears and no mouth. So sound is not important, but vision is. So sight is important, but the big eyes mean they may be nocturnal. They may come from a place where there's uh, very little light. So a larger eye uh, captures more ambient light. So we can, we can draw a lot of conclusions from some of these images and think where do these, where do these beings come from? What kind of environment? What can we assume about their background? So that's in Secret Machines Man as well and some more uh, science and from various, various uh, backgrounds. Neurology, for instance, um, the neurological development of the human being, what does that mean? How are the various uh, nervous systems, how do they operate, and what does it imply about an alien nervous system, for instance? So that kind of stuff is in Secret Machines, man. And this is the first one, and uh, Peter is the nonfiction writer, and the second one you have turned in. Uh, we don't know exactly when it's going to be released, okay. but it will be in this sequence, and then there will be a third. Mm -hmm. This is all nonfiction. All nonfiction, that's right. And then, and all of this is available on Amazon, I just want to stress again, because when you get into these books, his brilliance, his ability to deal with the complex layers uh, you have a feeling that you are uh, being uh, drawn and shown layers that you will want to go yourself and start learning more and more and more about what Peter Lavenda exposes you to in the Lovecraft Code, which is fiction based on nonfiction. And then this latest book, which is absolutely amazing. This is the Dunwich. And Dunwich is uh, the middle book 
of a, a third that is starry wisdom and starry wisdom is going to maybe come out in 2019 yes i think may is when it's going to be published so these are really really important parallel tracks nonfiction and fiction and uh what i'm hoping that you can do this again at some point after the next book is out because there is still so much to go and talk about. To, sure. And we're all going to continue to be learning uh, about what, as this evolution into trying to get the white world science up to speed, maybe, hopefully, with at least some of the breakthroughs in our uh, black dark space program, that maybe this year, I've got a couple of dinner bets that by New Year's Day 2019, we will at least have had the headline, we're not alone in the universe, and it doesn't matter if it is microbes on Mars, swimming creatures in Enceladus, fast radio bursts from a transport system. If we can just get that one huge paradigm shift, we are not alone in this universe, all boats rise, Everybody on the planet will then be more released, not having to be afraid of talking about encounters, abductions, animal mutilations, and maybe all of that will help the whole world begin to not be so afraid, to not be afraid of fellow human ridicule. That is what I hope will come out of all of us moving forward to truth, including the government, and to having compassion for those in the government who have kept this a secret since World War II because they were afraid that if they didn't have the answers, they couldn't tell not just the American public, but the world, the truth about alien presences that they did not understand. And we're getting closer and closer to seeing how complex it is and yet in that complexity, which is in Peter Lavenda's work, there is a tremendous excitement because if we're in a universe where the mind and consciousness as it links to a quantum universe is the key to it all, we are on the most exciting adventure. And that's where I hope we continue to go. Hey, thanks everybody for being here tonight and Peter, Thank Wonderful. You. Thank you much. so much.